Well, hello and welcome to Kenley Common, home of RAF Kenley, otherwise known as Kenley Aerodrome. So we're gonna have a little bit of a tour around today. It's a walk and talk with a difference because I get the benefit of some very special guests who are part of the Kenley Revival team. So uh, without further ado, let's get on our way. It's a very well guided site and extremely accessible. Pathways throughout, uh, there's a perimeter track because it is actually a, a working airfield. So I've just come in from Hayes Lane and there's a bit of a story about that which uh, Linda will tell us about. The overall location is sort of between Whiteleaf, Causton, Catrum on the Hill, so southeast of London or south to southeast of London. And certainly, well, partly during the First World War and the Second World War, it was a key place for the defence of London. So let's start by hearing from Linda Duffield from Kenley Revival. She'll give you a bit of background, talk about the tribute itself, and then we'll kick off our tour and our walk and talk with guests. Kenley Revival was a heritage lottery funded project that was set up by City of London, Historic England and Kenley Airfield Friends Group. Um, and it aimed really to preserve some of the structures left over from World War II that you can still see on the airfield and to do community engagement, um, workshops for schools, a website and so on, and try and increase people's knowledge about the history of the airfield and you know what had happened at Kenley. The memorial was a millennium project so it's been here since 2000. It isn't a memorial in fact it pays tribute to everybody that served here and the squadrons that served here are listed down the sides. There are, are Canadian squadrons, Belgian squadrons, New Zealand, Australia, Polish squadrons, every allied nationality served here. Kenley wasn't a, a fighter airfield in the beginning, it was set up as an air acceptance park. The idea was that components for aircraft would be brought up here, engines, airframes, fuselage, wings. Basically they would be assembled here, the instruments and guns calibrated and then flown out to the squadrons in France. That's why we had a huge amount of hangars, hangar space and obviously then it was a grass airfield and it wasn't a fighter station until the 1920s. This is the most intact fighter station associated with the Battle of Britain. Right. There's very little remaining in terms of buildings, mm. but the runways are in their original configuration and that's very unusual. And the actual layout of the working part of the airfield hasn't been changed is quite remarkable, really. Mm. And the collection of pens that are around the edge is another remarkable survivor as well. The airfield did extend across to the other side of Hayes Lane in various positions along Golf Road, kind of edged back into the tree line there. The layout during World War II was slightly different to what you see today. Yeah. Hayes Lane was closed throughout the entire war. They basically, right. re Hayes Lane used to run across the airfield. Oh, I see. And um, just before war broke out, they diverted it around and then immediately closed it. The runway was extended across Hayes Lane on that side and also extended up on the north end as well. You'll see on the ground that there are outlines of two aircraft. The pen is actually a sort of E shape and these are being repaired, there's sort of running repairs that needs to take place and some of them are in a better state of repair than others but others are just similar to how they were. So it's a mixture as you go around. There's 12 of these pens around the airfield, or there was 12, there's yes. 11 left. Uh, and each could house two, two aircraft. This whole structure is, a, is a, called a blast pen. So yes. if a bomb sort of landed locally, it would, the blast would be diverted over the top. But they seem quite happy, don't they? they? Are, yeah, there's, <laughs> there's plenty of rare spiders around as well, apparently. Wow. Uh, but obviously if a bomb landed actually in one of these bays, then everyone would like, run into here and board the doors quick. Okay. And, and also some of the ammunition would have been kept in there for like re reloading the planes. We think there would have been like bench seats along each side as mm -hmm. well, possibly in some of them. There's two different structures as well. This, this one's made of like pre-cast concrete strips that would have been brought in and assembled here. Right. Uh, but over the other side, they're actually made of like a, a corrugated circular tunnel almost. And then with concrete poured over the top of them. Right. Again, we don't know why there are two different sorts, whether they started doing one sort and then realised that this would have been better, or we, we just really don't know. I mean, availability of materials possibly? Could have been that, that as well, yeah. yeah. They were thrown up in a hurry, really, as well, because, you know, they, they started in late 39. Yeah. 
and I think by March or April, I think they were all pretty much finished. If you can see on, on top of that, that centre pin, there are those bolts that stick up. Oh, I see. And, and they, they're also mirrored on the outer arms. We're not too sure what they are, but the only thing we can think was that there were poles st st stuck on the top and netting strung across. But right. the poles would have to be pretty high because because yeah. the aircraft are, are pretty tall, really. Yes. To, and to clear that, you know, because obviously you get sag over that distance. Yes. But that's that's all we can assume that they're for. Yeah. There's, there's no photographic evidence that anyone's seen. The history of these these end walls, if you like, if you look at the outer ones, they're actually made of a brick and a half thick. Yes. which is a reasonable strength. But these, these centre ones were only ever one brick wide, or one brick thickness. So they were a bit floppy when they were filled with earth, and they had a tendency to fall over. Oh. So they started off, we believe, by putting these tie bars on to try and secure them a bit better. And then eight of them had this, this buttress built on the front of them to give them a bit more mm. support. But the ones on the other side, they actually had more of these tie bars like stuck into the wall front as well. And if you, if you look just, just by the foot of that fence, you can see an indent in the concrete. Yes. So the original wall would have just been a single wall that butted there and went all the way along. But obviously, if, if you had a bomb land quite close to a single wall of that height, it's just going to topple, Yeah. which is why they put the triangular supporting bits on. The fog and this kind of low cloud plays a big part in Kenley's history as well. Right. That's, that's kind of an important fact that there were various questions asked during like 1919 as to whether Kenley was actually a suitable place for an airfield because of the the lo low cloud and the mm. fog and this tendency for the weather to just close in there was a, a, a crash in 19 in 1919 which killed an American banker called George Franklin Rand and uh, the pilot was flying from Paris to Hounslow in fact and they tried to get into Kenley when the weather closed in and crashed over by the Guards Depot at Caterham, um, and after that there were there were serious questions asked about whether there should be an airfield here, whether there are enough diversionary airfields at that point, yeah. and so on and so forth. So the weather played played a big part too. Today is the anniversary of his crash at Woodley, in Reading. He flew from Kenley. The, the crash. Yes, yeah. the yeah. crash. The crash that happened. That, you know, yeah. that happened on this day in 1931 wow. he took off from here flew to Woodley and was dared to fly at nought feet it went wrong and he went in and um yeah he lost both legs and um the rest is history the rest really is yeah history. I'm going to point out the, these piles at the side we think were also associated with the bolts on top of the, the concrete strips because they've got these metal rings on. Yeah. So you can oh, obviously tie, tie something right. onto there and up over the, the pens because each one of the pens has got these concrete piles as we call them but they're not really piles. No, they don't go anywhere and they show up massively on aerial photos. Yeah, you can really cool. see these. Um, right. So let's say we've got a... We've got a... Rings, I think, rings every yeah. four feet. Every four yeah. feet, so... Yeah. And they're really and then we've got sturdy. got the edge of a, a pen here. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. And there would have been some kind of. We believe so. Webbing netting. So we've been looking for, for, for a photo of a blast pen anywhere, never mind Kenley, just anywhere with camouflage netting over it. And right. so far we've drawn a blank. There, folks, is your challenge. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, but this is the thing, you know, one of the, one of the reasons that I do these is to open things up. Um, I'm convinced that people do have information, maybe photos, and uh, if we can open it up to whomever, please get in touch. You can see here, the central walls had no foundations. Yeah. This would have had a central wall as well. They all started with the single one, but they all ended up with the, like the Toblerone shaped one, as I call them, by, right. by the end. Well, we don't know about yeah. by the end. Oh, the I see. Certainly, right, certainly okay. by 47, they had yeah. that Toblerone shape. So they were just a, a partition. Yeah. A very basic partition. Yeah, yeah, you know, the, the concrete base is just kind of continues underneath them. It would stop fire from spreading from, yes. from you know, if you had, bearing in mind that the aircraft sitting here, if, you know, during a raid could be fuelled and armed, mm. the last thing that you want is all that ammunition cooking off when you've got another aircraft mm. sitting right next to it in the pen. You know, th that wall, you know, we might, it might seem like a kind of poor construction and everything, but it would provide some shelter for yeah. anyone on the other side um, and the aircraft itself.
a gun emplacement there, so that what anti aircraft yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Yes. We we believe they would have been like a like a single pole going up and then two Lewis guns mounted on the on the pole. This is the only one that's got one of these on an arm. There's, there's one over the other side that's got one built into a corner. Yes. Right. And there's another one over the other side of Hayes Lane that's got a rectangular one and a circular one next to each other on a corner. So this is just a 25 yard small arms range for shooting practice. The two sort of concrete walls that you can see down at the base, yes. that would have been where the target was. Oh, I see. The, the wall would have been banked up much higher with sand and there were kind of retaining walls at the side that would have kind of held the sand in. And the wall is sort of buttressed at the back. There was a shelter kind of corrugated. People would have been under the shelter here firing. An absolutely essential skill for everybody. Mm not just the pilots. But everyone's always kind of like, why, why have we got a you know, rifle range on an airfield? But of course, this was built in the 1920s. Yes. And, and it was, you know, it was a, a, this, this was for fighter squadrons. You know, the, mm. the shooting skills for everybody were vital. Yeah. You know, anti-aircraft gunners, the ground crews, everybody was expected to be able to defend the airfield. There was a massive, massive shed here before the blast pens and everything. There was a huge shed that ran down this side of the airfield that was intended to be used for the production of Vickers Vimy's and Handley Page 0400s um, at the end of the Great War. The RAF had paid for the contract to be fulfilled and so even though the war had ended and it still hadn't been finished, they had it finished anyway and didn't really have any use for it. But of course a lot of aircraft that were being disposed of that were coming back from France ended up stored in the shed. It was finally demolished in 1936 because it was an obstruction to the, to the incoming aircraft. The hangars, Kenley's original Belfast roof truss general service sheds, were all along here in this area here. What I brought you over here to see is that the last hangar was there and this patch of grass here was where the signal square was. Okay, so that's the last hangar which would have stood there and the watch office, which was the closest that Kenley kind of ever came to having a control tower. The runners for the hangar doors went along here. This is the, the internal so this, floor. This is almost, again, the, like that, what's left at Hounsy Green and yes, where the stables are. Yes, absolutely. It's the same, same kind of idea. Yeah. And if you look along here, you can kind of see where the buttresses were. Uh, intervals, those those yeah. sort of buttresses along the side, along the external yeah. wall of the hangar, they're here. So it's only when you, even at this angle, you step back and you just see see the lines. You can visualise it, can't you? Yeah. You know, you've got the whole structure. What starting just here, That's right. going across, and then as you mentioned earlier, and the other the, the sections that made it up. You can download a guide for your walk here at Kenley. I'll put a link in the description below to make it easy. And as you go round, you can sort of tick off all the sites at the location of the officer's mess. After it closed from formal RAF activities, it had a few owners and a few different purposes, but it's fallen into disrepair. It is currently owned. There is planning permission to do some very nice renovation work and have apartments and the like. It's a beautiful site. It's almost a, a memorial in itself. In here, in you know, the, the other side of these bushes, was where the ops room was, the original ops room, right. um, which was in operation until the hardest day, the 18th of August 1940, when the communications were cut. It's just a single story, brick built, like bungalow style of building with an earth revetment around it, yeah. incredibly unprotected. Um, Right. After, after they, when, once they realised how vulnerable it was during that um, raid, they moved it to a butcher shop in Caterham High Street, which they had I as a practice. There's, there's a blue a... plaque there now, oh, okay. a blue, blue plaque, a Bourne Society plaque yeah, one right. of, oh, okay. at, the, at the butcher shop. Oh, nice, it gets fat We had yeah. uh, photographs of all of the um, personnel that lost their lives during the Battle of Britain all along the fence for the 80th anniversary. 44 killed mm. while serving here during you know during the Battle of Britain period and we also paid tribute to one member of the civil defence William Battle who was killed defending Kenley Waterworks on um, the 18th of August 1940 not strictly speaking a Kenley serving at Kenley mm. but we we had him on here anyway so that made it up to 45 
that that was one thing that we were determined to do with the memorial when we started looking for the people that were killed serving here. We've um, they're all on there. Yeah. Uh, ground crew, people that were killed in accidents, um, you know, people that were killed in unfortunate accidents on the ground. Um, a WAF who was killed in a bombing raid while on leave in Eastbourne yeah. and people who died of their injuries later. Mm. Um, you know, we're, we're, we're seeking them all, um, not just the pilots. Mm. Vic Bashford remembers standing here on this side of the airfield and seeing, the way he describes it, he, he, he could see the raiders on the 15th of August 1940, he saw the raiders coming along here, going on their way to Croydon. Oh. And he, his, his memory of it is that they were lower than he was, or at the same level, coming along there. Of course, we often forget the, the you know, we, or when we talk about the history of the airfield, we forget the impact that it had on the local communities that surrounded it. Mm. That, you know, a lot of civilians in the surrounding area were, were killed by bombing raids that were aimed at the airfield. Yeah. And also a lot of people left their homes, you know, they were evacuated out of the area. The properties were requisitioned for the use of the service personnel on the airfield. And, you know, there was a lot of disruption and, and um, you know, general mayhem for the people that lived around the airfield. Mm. Going back even earlier though, back in 1917-18, the, the aircraft were brought here to be assembled, mm. but they were trucked up from the station, from Wallingham Station, right. up the hill, so they, they have the, the wings on and tail on the, on the lorry, and then they tow the fuselage up to the airfield to have it to have to be assembled and test flown uh, before they were issued to squadrons. Mm. It was in the middle of three railway stations and it had electricity and water service right. um, and that was why it was sited here okay. you know and it's level and high you know. Yeah th well this, this would have been a gantry, gantry going over to that one over there huh? right and then the fuel okay. lines would have been from the top from supply from that pipe which presumably goes into the tank Okay. Underneath the pipe. <laughs> and I would have put the bowsers round underneath the gantry and filled up the bowser, and then the bowser would have gone to refuel the individual planes. So obviously there were quite a lot of ground defences here along this bank. Um, there were there were you know slit trenches. We've got evidence of slit trenches all down here, mm -hmm. and of course it's a perfect place for them because you know you kind of want rising ground behind you. With a slit trench, if you stick your head over a trench, you'll get it yeah. shot off. But if there's ground behind you, it's not quite so obvious. Yeah. These little concrete paths down here, there were dispersal huts yeah. all along here. Nissen huts, dispersal huts. Tourism. Yeah, yeah, all kinds of stuff. You know, all Waiting gone for now. the call. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Almost like a mini, mini village. Yeah. Yes, yeah. yes, yeah. yeah. All yeah. The basics and... Yes. And the earth is original, not that <laughs> yeah, they, it is they, original. <laughs> yeah, they, they, they keep taking it out and putting it back, but it's, it is, yeah, it's the original, as far as I know. They found bluebells in it and God yeah. knows what, didn't they? Yeah, which sort of indicated that it was local and just taken, well, obviously it was local and just taken out the back and it's thrown in stony, there. It's isn't it? Whereas the one yeah. they've, they've rebuilt over there is just earth, isn't it? Yeah. So, so that would yeah. be the original... Sort yeah, of yes. It's just straight, wall, it's straight, yeah. Yes. straight bit, and then obviously yeah. these are the supporters. This is the only. This is, this is the only centre wall that survived on the common ground. You know, mm. this is all your tie down points. Um, there's one. In, why on the other side? There's what's got a got a ring in it still, hasn't it? Yeah. There's there's about fourteen of them if you really look for them in this in this side. There, there's loads everywhere. Yeah, obviously this is this is to stop your aircraft taking to the air when you don't want it to. Yeah. Blowing away. Yeah. Ah, oh, <laughs> it's all the builders. Yes. It's still got the ring. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, in some ways it'll give it a bit of, bit of protection. Yes. Too. Yeah. And also this is quite good because this is, I presume, the original concrete. It is. The yes. Other tag tarmac put over yes. As well. Yes. Nice. No. This is this is a, this is a lovely pen. This one. Oh yeah. Original surface. 
So what became of Kenley towards the end of the war? Well, the V1s and then V2s were starting to arrive and target London. So there's a lot of, sort of balloon activity around here to try and stop those, ideally in their tracks. And as such, you can't really have planes taking off and landing. And after that, it was almost a victim of aircraft technology because planes were getting bigger, faster, engine technology was changing towards jets, and the runways here weren't big enough for jet aircraft. So that was it, I'm afraid, for Kenley. There was the odd uh, display or air day and that kind of thing. But no powered aircraft have been here for many years. But it is home to the 615 Volunteer Gliding Squadron and gliding activity still takes place here, so it's a sort of branch of the Air Cadets. So it's still RAF, it's still MOD. A few very well-deserved thanks are in order. Firstly, the Kenny Revival team. They've been so, so helpful. Linda, Neil and Tony, thank you. I really appreciate what you've done. I appreciate what you do and to help me to be able to put this film together. Also I'd like to thank the people that look after the site. So it's Kenley Common, it's open 24 hours a day, seven days a week. You can come down here. All the whole perimeter track and area is accessible. You see people taking their exercise. Also I'd like to thank uh, the Bourne Society, uh, East Surrey Museum, Caterham Library. There are so many. Thank you all. Uh, they've been really supportive, all of you guys, to, to what I'm doing here. So thank you. And I'll see you in my next video.